year was 1917. For three years, Europe had been entrenched in the Great War, the First World War. A neutral United States was drawn into the fight on April 6, 1917, when President Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany. This put many wheels in motion, including the purchase of 832 acres of farmland just across the Susquehanna River from Harrisburg, the state capital of Pennsylvania. The U.S. delayed its in involvement in World War I, and after the president made the decision that they would be in become involved, it became a very expedited process to create a support mechanism for the troops that were headed overseas. In April 1918, construction began, and on May 14, 1918, the Army raised the flag over the new Cumberland U.S. Quartermaster Interior Storage Depot. 100 years back, they got it right. They put this installation right in the middle of the railroad network back in the day. We're located at the confluence of the Susquehanna River and uh, Yellow Reaches Creek, which won't be much to some people. If you're a trout fisherman, you'll know what it is right away. The workers that worked here in those days were paid two to three dollars a day to do the construction work to build the, the warehouses, and the horses with the saddle were paid three dollars a day. We had an engine right on the depot, and of course the trains would come right into the depot and then maneuver them around on the depot. It was a good part, not only made sense for the military and a storage depot, but it's somewhere people wanted to come. It's somewhere people would come and they would stay and they would serve their whole career here. And so began a century-long relationship between a community and its country, a patriotic people supporting their nation's brave men and women wherever the mission would take them around the world. You got some seats back here, sir. Huh? No, no, just sit down, we'll fix you up. And what did we have in mind today? The normal. The normal. I've been coming in here 65 years and still have to ask. <laughs> We're in our fourth generation of a barber shop now. We've had uh, a very good rapport throughout the years with, uh, with the depot. It's uh, like another part of our town. The town has been uh, a very patriotic town ever since I can remember. There's a lot of people that outside the town. You go to a local restaurant, you can bring the story about Army Depot. And that people light up. You know, that people say, wow, yeah, my grandpa was there and my father was there. And it's, it's joy. Well, it's always been very important to the community because when they first started it out, it was on a small scale, but there were, I believe in 1918, there were like 1,500 people uh, living in New Kremlin. Uh, by the end of World War II, there were almost 10,000. The entrance into World War II brought great expansion to the installation. The depot saw an influx of soldier recruits, depot workers, and POWs from Germany. There was a lot of activity here uh, during World War II, a lot of activity. At one point, they had uh, POWs uh, from Germany, and they would bring the townspeople down to watch the POWs play soccer. I saw my first soccer game, uh, and it was between uh, German POWs because soccer was not a popular sport around here at the time. But the Germans knew how to play soccer. I had met um, a gentleman where I worked who was a POW. That one, you know, that was very interesting. He was a very nice guy. Some of the best baseball teams uh, were formed right here at New Cumberland because the professional baseball players that went into the service were inducted through here. Through the years, the depot continued to share its facilities and services with the community. The example was set from the top by the installation's commanders. This is General Pillsbury. General Pillsbury, his birthday was on the 4th of July, so he'd have a, a birthday cookout in his backyard. He went on to be a three-star general, great officer, great American. We would come down and eat here many, many nights during the week because I had never learned to cook. And why would you learn to cook when you can have a steak dinner for two and a quarter? They did raise the prices a little to 250, but that was okay. We could all deal with that. The officers' wives club also ran a nursery at one time. And so mothers could drop their children off at the nursery 
and then they could go on to work. It provided a swimming pool for my daughter that learned how to swim at that depot pool. Community Day, we always supported the New Cumberland Halloween Parade. We always supported the New Cumberland Memorial Day Parade. There was just a lot of town involvement. This installation provides key support to the communities as they have first class fire department, we have first class police department, and we provide uh, great care both off the installation and on. Beginning in the 1950s, the installation continued to adapt and evolve as it took on new missions. Four warehouses were built, numbers 82 through 85, and were known as the Golden Mile. The culture of the depot was changing too. Predominantly the women were in administrative jobs and the men were more, leaning more toward the manual type jobs, the trade type jobs. It's just the way it was. I was a typist and I learned that every package that we shipped needed a label. You learned how they packed things, why they were doing what they were doing. But at that time, you didn't have a lot of women in, you know, in higher grade supervision. They decided, well, we really need you to go where they're unloading the trucks. So I had worked in Warehouse 84. My new boss drug my chair down U Avenue and he said, now just you know, this is a man's world and I am not going to have those guys change their way and, because I was going to be the only female in that warehouse. And uh, the guys cut me no slack, but let a truck driver say anything to me and boy, they, they were right there backing me up. There, at that time, there were a lot of veterans working there and uh, I just fit in really well there. They're the hard working bunch of guys and, and I just liked being there. The conditions weren't easy, but the pride and commitment of the workers carried the mission forward. Train come through the depot. Right beside the World 53 Bay 1, we have to offload, offload tires by hand. So literally when you opened the box car that was filled with tires, you had to be very careful because when you slid the doors open, the tires would sometimes spring out. I worked in a warehouse where they did, um, where they stored tires. The black dust from those tires was unbelievable. It was a tough time to work, but the job had to be done. And there was a lot of pride. I know a lot of people take the real pride even what they have. In 1972, Mother Nature submerged New Cumberland underwater. But it was a man-made accident at the end of the decade that closed the doors on the installation. In 1972, Hurricane Agnes came through our area here and dumped approximately 28 inches of rain. Our normal river stage is five to nine feet. And when the hurricane went through, it got up to like 33 feet of water. The only way you could get to the depot was on a helicopter. And we also, had, we were within 10 miles of TMI, Three Mile Island. And I was here when that had happened in 1979. That's the first time that I saw people crying tears and can't go nowhere. First time that I see those metal doors going from bay one to bay two, just a slide. And they're heavy. You got to slide it and close it. In the mid 70s, the Vietnam conflict ended and equipment was returning home. The depot was working overtime to keep up with repairs and maintenance mid-70s, there was a lot of stuff still coming back from Vietnam, and we had the uh, air maintenance mission there, so we were getting a lot of the damaged helicopters coming back that we repaired. They actually had a whirl tower where they tested the uh, helicopter blades that had been repaired, and so you often had the pump, 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 pump of helicopter blades you know, hours at a time. The workload was astronomical. In fact, when I first started, they told me they would not hire me unless I worked a minimum of eight hours overtime a week because it was just a huge um, workload that had come as a result of, of the end of the war. We were involved in starting the small pack line which improved operations and a lower cost and I was lucky enough to get one of Jimmy Carter's presidential uh, suggestion awards and uh, so that was October 5th, 1979. 
President Ronald Reagan led the free world and drove change. The 1980s saw the Berlin Wall come down and the Cold War end. It was a time of peace, but also uncertainty at the depot. I remember that time. I remember a couple of rifts where people received letters on their hand. That real sad to see. The supervisors coming up and pulling them off the floor and then taking them down to a, an office where they met with human resources as a division chief in the union and they were given their letter of dismissal. We supported all of the Middle East. Um, and I believe that is one of the main reasons that in the EDC, why we remain open today. Because we were not bracked and it was because of what was happening here at New Cumberland and how well we did things. New ways of getting the job done were on the horizon. The technology revolution was here. The Army successfully pitched the construction of the Eastern Distribution Center. The building sent a message that Susquehanna was going to be the centerpiece of military logistics and distribution for the foreseeable future. When Congress decided to approve the construction of a, a $200 million plus distribution center, the largest of its kind in the Department of Defense, here in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, it was kind of a signal of two things. Uh, one, uh, that New Cumberland is pretty good at distribution, right, because you don't make that type of an investment in an organization that isn't really being successful. And two, this was going to be an enduring mission for the installation. Uh, again, you don't put that much money into an installation with the thought that you're not going to be doing that for a very long time. The engineers had a clear approach to modern mechanization and computerization of the business. Construction of the 1.7 million square foot facility was completed on July 21st, 1989. So the design of the EDC incorporated uh, what we call a uh, material to worker design. So what we put in the building was a, a large tow line system that was about 5.3 miles long. It had 1,100 carts that pulled material through the building. There was another four and a half miles of conveyor systems, package conveyor and pallet conveyor. There was even a robot. They asked people to come up and help with the testing, and I, I come up and I couldn't get over the vastness of the building. At that time, it was the largest distribution center, I think, in the world. So we had these uh, uh, cranes that were man aboard that were meant to go 60 feet in the air. And uh, that was a, a bit of a cultural shift, uh, and there was special training needed on that. They needed somebody to teach folks how to repel out of the 60 foot high rise area, so I volunteered for that as well. I was young. <laughs> I thought that sounded fun. The EDC began its operation in the middle of the war, Desert Storm, which was the worst thing that could happen because we were all of the support for the Middle East. So it was kind of chaotic, uh, and it was a stress for the workforce, quite frankly. You know, they had all been trained on the new building, but until you start using it, you're not really comfortable with it. Uh, the mission was going through the roof. But that was the beginning of, of the automation. It, it was phenomenal. At one time, we were just considered box kickers. And it, it was important for everyone to understand our place in the supply chain and the criticality of it. And I think that's, that's what the installation added with all the new features that we were introducing and their broader customer base and how they could be responsive. And that's when we started talking about we were offering tailored logistics and the installation was the prime source of those tailored logistics. Everyone in the area is very proud to say that's the Army out there, and we really appreciate that. I used to go down on that depot when I had prisons there. <laughs> when I was in, just out of high school, John Kennedy drove right up through New Cumberland. He landed in the airport out here and drove right up through New Cumberland. We have had a wonderful rapport with the military throughout the last 60 years that I can remember. Through the years, the name has changed. The buildings have gone up and come down. But the thousands of people from every origin and experience have worked here with one heart, one purpose, with true dedication 
determination, and patriotism. From its humble roots as the New Cumberland Army Depot uh, 100 years ago, uh, to the global uh, mission that it has today, uh, there's been a lot of people who have contributed to that, to, to the success of, of the, the installation's mission, but really to the security of the Department of Defense. I actually started in distribution in 1966. I started in August of 1973. I came here in 1975. I actually started here in August of 1977. I've been here about 29 years now. So this is my 35th year with the agency. 36 years on the 22nd of this month. The other day I got my award for 40 years. I have 41 years this June. When I retired, with a total of 41 years of service. I love the place, I love the mission, I love the people, uh, and I stayed. This will sound corny, but somebody out there in some hole somewhere really needed the input of what was coming out of this depot. It is so true. It's not all about guns and ammunition and things like that. You know, it's to help that warfighter get through the day. It's the one little thing that you can do for your country. You know, and you really, I don't know how you can't take pride in that because you're supporting the warfighter, you know, and, and we're free because of them.